Hello, today we have been given the opportunity to shoot in this unique space, and I'm not going to ask you my traditional question, which is, try to guess where we are this time. I think you should know. If you don't happen to know, that's a bit of a shame, because we are in one of the most amazing villas in the world, Villa Tugendhat, and we're going to give you a full introduction to it today. We're in Brno in Sonopolny Street, and I always liked it so much that the house is inconspicuous. It's basically a small one-story house that doesn't pretend to be something terribly big and important and doesn't occupy some huge piece of public space. It has an extremely low fence, you can see a lot of things, and at the same time there's a pretty big view of the city skyline that allows anyone walking by to look out over the city. The most dominant feature visible from the street is the garage, which is the only one in direct contact between the property line and the neighborhood. At the same time, all the service facilities are located under the garage. That is, places for staff, for the chauffeur and so on. Then there's a hole that allows you to see the whole skyline of the city and anyone who walks by. And then the house itself begins. It's quite interesting that you can see almost nothing of the house. You can't see its main entrance, you can't see hardly any windows, there's just this little shot of a bathroom and it's basically an opaque thing, so the house itself takes care of creating privacy for what's going on next. It's not solved by some high wall or by a wall or by some huge fence. On the contrary, you can see a lot of things, but the architecture is done in such a way that it provides privacy for the inhabitants. From the garden from the south, the house looks really different than from the street. At one point it is a three-story house, although you may not perceive it that way, because its plinth is solid, full, contains utility rooms and has almost no windows. Then comes the all-important living communal floor with huge glazing that allows any contact with the outside. And then the private floor of small rooms and bedrooms, which is almost impossible to see from here. This plot was given to Greta Thugenhat as a dowry from her father who lived down the road and he cut her a piece of his land and said, you could build a house here. So I have to say it was a pretty good dowry. In the 20th century, there are probably only three basic concepts of how to place a building on terrain. The first one was invented by Frank Lloyd Wright, and he said that the house should continue seamlessly into the surrounding garden so that you open the door, you walk out, everything is on the same plane, and there's really no difference between when you're inside and when you're outside. Corbusier came up with the second one, and he said that on the contrary, you have to raise the house high above the ground, on the pilings, on the piles, and there you create a new plane, a new quality. Mies van der Rohe is a kind of theater stage, slightly raised above the terrain, which allows you a better view, but still in contact. And here the house has also taken advantage of the sloping terrain, so the principle is played out to the maximum. This is actually a simple connection from the main living floor to the garden. It could be a tiny inconspicuous staircase, but it's not. It's this kind of serious, serious, wide, monumental travertine staircase. And whenever an architect goes over the top like that, he makes it clear that this is an important thing. It's not something insignificant. So when there's been a number of different social events going on here, people are in the garden, somebody's standing around, somebody's talking, it's really got a proper dimension to it, and I think that adds a great generosity to it.
We are on the main residence terrace, which is connected to the largest living area. You can see the two elements of the supporting structure here, but quite important here is the milk glass, which on the one hand provides privacy, so you don't know what's going on in the neighboring plot, but at the same time it creates a lee. So again, an extremely large area to sit here and have a bite to eat and be in touch with the city and with nature. Behind the terrace is a more enclosed volume like this, which contained the chauffeur's housing, the garage, the rest of the staff, some technical equipment. It's something that's actually part of the house, but it's very cleverly hidden and separated, so if you don't want to watch it, you don't even know about it. The whole house is actually strictly rectangular, but it has a few exceptions. There are a couple of parts where the geometry is broken, there's a whole section of the circle at one time, and this, I think, was something that Mies was very good at that whenever this kind of thing appears, it's an important accent. Something is highlighted by it. Here, for example, the entrance to the house. Some people think that the Tugendats gave Mies a completely free hand to do whatever he wanted, but this is not true. They had a different view on a whole range of things than he did. For example, they wanted the steel columns in this part to be hidden in the walls so that it would have a more traditional, intimate character. And he eventually agreed, but he said that again he insisted that all the doors and all the windows had to be connected floor to ceiling, which they didn't like at first because it was terribly expensive. But he insisted on it and he knew exactly why. For one thing, it adds an incredible monumentality, gravitas and seriousness to the whole space. But for another thing, it's quite practical because there's no stale air up there under the ceiling. And when you ventilate, you really ventilate the complete volume of air out of the whole room. Today we got a unique opportunity to spend the whole day here. It's a Monday, it's closed, so we got to see the place. And we decided to take advantage of that to give you the house in different situations, both in the daylight, when the sun is shining, it's all beautiful and lit up, and at night when suddenly the thing behaves completely differently, it has a completely different atmosphere, and the views of the city look really very different. And I think this house has a very strong point which is that it very much takes on the characteristics and the atmosphere of its surroundings. It can respond to it. It's not that it only looks good under one set of conditions. Those conditions can change and the house can handle that beautifully. This house clearly belongs in the textbooks of 20th century architecture and perhaps of all time. And maybe it's a good question why. I think there are several reasons, but let's say the most important one is that this is a completely unique space. A free flowing space that has a music room, that has a dining room, that has a library, that has a study, that has a garden, that has a view of the neighborhood, and it's all one space. It's framed by an extremely subtle steel structure that was used in a family home for perhaps the first time, or one of the first times in Europe. It's as if it wasn't there at all. And what's more, thanks to the chrome surface on the outside, it mirrors its surroundings to the maximum and is virtually absent. And then the other thing is that really Mies and his collaborator Lily Reich had an eye for detail. They were terribly interested in the details and they paid a great deal of attention to absolutely everything here. That's extraordinary and unusual even today that somebody would go into every detail, every chair, every lamp, every rivet, every surface, every material, so that it feels like a whole Two important quotes attributed to Mies are, less is more, and God is in the detail. Both of those quotes are somehow materialized here. 
What I think is important is that when you find yourself in any place, it contains the essence of the whole house. Let's try and get that right here. We have artificial light coming in from the side, which is hidden behind a kind of milky wall, so you can't actually see the source, but somehow it transforms the atmosphere. There's beautiful furniture here, specifically a chair called Barno, so designed for this house, which has a similar principle to the supporting structure. It's shiny, reflective, reflects everything in the environment, maximally immaterial. The same goes for this iron column, which is hidden in this chrome casing. Behind me, you see a piece of Macassa veneer. It's an incredibly beautiful material that stands on its own. And because there's minimal stuff here, it has to be perfect. In traditional houses, the most important role is played by the walls. This is not the case here. Here, the walls are non-load-bearing elements. The supporting structure is iron, thin, almost invisible. And whenever there is a wall, it is non-load-bearing and has some other role. So behind me is a completely beautiful onyx wall that basically just makes a kind of tiny division between the study and the living area. This is the famous onyx wall, sovereignly the most expensive element in the entire quarry building from Morocco. It's thin, only seven centimeters wide, and when the winter sun shines on it in the afternoon or early evening, its colors begin to change. Here you can see it a little bit when suddenly the sand color starts to turn orange, sometimes even dark red. I think even the architect was quite surprised by the lighting effects that this stone could produce. He grew up in a family of stonemasons, so he knew it quite well, but still, the thing worked incredibly well here. It was also one of the things where there was a lot of haggling between the builder and the architect, because the thing was really, really expensive. And the Tugendat said, we don't have to have this, it's too luxurious, it's almost unnecessary. But I think they were quite happy afterwards. We are in the dining room, which is subject to similar principles as the main living room. It's a semi-open, semi-closed space. Plus, we're tucked away in this archway. It's like we're inside a hollowed out tree trunk. It's a beautiful veneer of Macassar that gives it atmosphere. And here's a table that could seat 8, 12, or the largest version, 18. So you can see that the family lived quite a social life. As you can see with those huge 5x3, 5 meter pieces of glass, it was possible to move up and down like that, so a technological marvel for its time, and you can even half fold it as you need to. So you can stop it at like this level where it acts as a railing for little kids, or you can set up a drink here. And at that point, the connection between the inside and the outside is absolutely perfect. So yes, you can be inside, you can be in a glass box, in a glass room looking at your surroundings, which is like wallpaper, but at that moment, when you really bring it down and you've got fresh air blowing in, you can hear the birds singing outside, you can hear the leaves moving. You're basically part of that outdoor space, and that's how the house was designed. It wasn't conceived as a garden and a house, it was conceived as a house garden as a whole. The vast majority of glass is single pane, so you can probably guess that the heating bill was huge. Also, one carload of coke a season fell on it here. But a lot of the stuff here has been thought out, so we can find heat sources under the windows, for example, so the inside doesn't get hot. And this house was the technological cutting edge of its time. It was incredibly innovative in the way it exchanged air just when it was heating. And that's what the director of Villa Tugendat will show us in a special bonus episode which is all about the technical background.
An extremely important part of the atmosphere of the interior is this conservatory, lined with two rows of glass, where at the same time, between the interior and the outer garden space, there is also this artificial garden. And of course, in the evening, you have no way of knowing what's outside, what's inside, what's in between, what's reflected. But even during the day, it performs this function where suddenly you're looking into the outdoor space through the filter of vegetation that's closer to you and that you can influence in some way. And this is a principle that has subsequently been copied by hundreds of architects around the world, how to blur the line between inside and outside. In the 1920s, many architects, including Mies, including Gropius, including Corbusier, dreamed that suddenly there would be a kind of free-flowing space that would contain all the different functions and that apartments would no longer be divided into individual small rooms. It's quite interesting that this dream of theirs didn't come true, and 90 years later, when apartments are sold today, they're still sold under the name of three-bedroom apartment, four-bedroom apartment, and so on. So this didn't happen. By the way, the conflict between these two concepts, between open space and individual small rooms that have their own private functions, can be seen in this house. You could say that the architect pushed for the former and the clients pushed for the latter. This is especially true for the living floor with individual bedrooms and children's rooms, which you will see in a moment. Behind me you see Greta Tugendat's bedroom. It's a relatively small room, kind of traditional, the way you might imagine a bedroom. What gives it some presence are the floor-to-ceiling cupboards and doors and a good connection to the exterior. But otherwise, here the Tugendats persuaded the architect to put load-bearing steel columns inside the walls, so it looks like a pretty ordinary house. We're in Fritz Tugendat's bedroom, and it's really very similar to Greta's bedroom. A simple rectangle, not too big, well connected to the outside terrace. The same goes for the children's rooms, for the two sons and for the daughter. The only exception on this floor is the nanny's room, which is not connected to the outdoor terrace and also served as a guest room. When someone came to visit, the governess stayed with her daughter. The bathrooms are beautiful elevated spaces that have light and air from above, so even when you're inside the layout you can air out, but at the same time it shows a high standard of hygiene. We see a lot of impeccable details, a power shower, a wash basin, separate for brushing teeth and for washing hands, because we're in a period where hygiene was really important and people were worried that actually if the standard wasn't high they'd get a bad deal. So this has been a place that has been given extra attention and it shows. The villa has been in existence for almost 90 years. Its principals spent only eight years of their lives here. The last phase came after 2012, when it reopened to the public after a costly and, in my opinion, excellent renovation. I understand that most of you, when you see this thing, think, I'd like to visit that, I'd like to see that too, but it's not quite that simple. If you look at the calendar, you'll see that it's sold out months in advance so it's quite hard to find exactly when to go here. The great thing for you is that you can go to the garden almost any time in good weather for an entrance fee of 50 CZK. You just have to check the website to see if there are any special events going on. If not, you can go into the garden, see the garden, 
and from the garden you can also go into the technical background where you can see the exhibition and the model and because of the complete glazing and opening to the outside you can see quite a lot of things inside. I would definitely recommend a visit to this place if only because it is one of the few houses you will find on the UNESCO list. When you go here you'll find that there's an incredible amount of beautiful details that someone has thought of and when you look at them you'll find that it's very inspiring.